Welcome to everyone who has joined us for our prayer meeting and Bible study. We're glad to see you all and we warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. Others, no doubt, will join us who are on the bus with the Bible Club ongoing this week. But we are delighted to see you all and we wel welcome you in the Saviour's name. Also to those that are joining with us on the World Wide Web, again, thank you for joining on a, a midweek and a night that perhaps you could be doing other things, but you've tuned in. And uh, whoever you are and wherever you are, we trust the Lord will bless his word to your heart. You'll be able to stay with us for the duration of the time of, of preaching, and then we will get down to prayer, and we will be remembering you and your family and the work of God here and elsewhere. Let's turn in our hymn books, or the words will come up on the screen, to 623. 623, God is here, and that to bless us. With the Spirit's quickening power, see the cloud already bending, waits to drop the grateful shower. Let it come, O Lord, we pray thee. Let the shower of blessing fall. We are waiting, we are waiting. O revive the hearts of all. We'll stand together after the key as we sing. Let's all stand as we worship. good singing. Do you appreciate that? Let's just by briefly in prayer before the Lord as we seek the Lord's face. Father, it is with thanksgiving that we are found once again in thy house, and it is in the mercy of God, Lord, that we are gathered together. We realize that circumstances could have been different. Who knows, Lord, what would have come our way? Who knows, Lord, what could have happened? And yet, Lord, we acknowledge thy goodness and grace and the fact that we are here, we can truthfully say that 
We're here for God to bless us, just as we can say God is here and that to bless us. So, Lord, we pray that you will do that. And we're gathered in the name of Christ, and we're two or three. And what a blessed number that is. And there are more than two or three here. And, Lord, gather together in thy name. There am I in the midst. And, Lord, we by faith have to bid thee welcome. We believe thy word to be true. We believe thy promise. We're two or three, wherever that is. Lord, here we are in a building. Here we are in a place in Cumber. Lord, a little spot upon thy created earth where two or three are gathered together in my name. And we're not under the umbrella of the free church tonight. We realize, Lord, we're gathered as a body of thy believing people, redeemed by precious blood, saved by sovereign grace and born of thy spirit. And in the name of the sole king and only head of the church, the the Redeemer of God's elect, the Savior of the body and the Savior of the world were gathered in his name. And Father, we thank thee and praise thee that he has promised that he will be in the midst. And Lord, we bid thee welcome. And we pray now you'll make us God conscious that we will know for sure that the Lord is here. We think of how uh, thy word declares Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. And so we pray, O God, that we will sense thy presence near us, that we will know for sure the Lord is sitting alongside. Lord, you've bent down thine ear to hear, and Lord, you're observing, you're watching. Lord, you're standing in our midst just now, and we are before thee, and we're in thy most holy and sacred presence. Lord, we're talking to thee now in prayer. We're addressing thee. Lord, we feel so unworthy. We realize we have to stand alone by blood. We realize, Lord, we dare not trust our own. We do not come to thee, Lord, in our own righteousness. We don't work our way. We don't present any good works. Lord, we don't have any ulterior motive for coming, but to worship thee, the God of heaven and of earth, and to extol and magnify and glorify and honor thy thrice holy name. We come to petition thee and supplicate the throne. We're gathered, O God, as a body of thy people, representative of the entire church body in this place. And we desire, O God, a right way for ourselves and for our children and for thy work. We want, Lord, to supplicate and petition thee for those that are not well, for some who are sorrowing, for some who are going through tough times, and others, Lord, who are facing, Lord, uh, different battles, Lord, with different things, for those who spiritually, Lord, are, uh, Lord, even... Lord, depressed and lonely for those who spiritually feel that the way is hard and difficult. And maybe others, Lord, who are on the mountaintop and have been shielded from the attacks of the enemy and have known the blessing of God and answers to prayer. And Lord, in many ways, they can truthfully say their soul is on the wing. And we pray, O oh God, whatever our spiritual condition, we're gathered, O oh God, before thee, and you're well able to look into our heart. You're able to see the need tonight. And as we would present the need of others, Lord, look upon our own hearts, look upon our own lives and our own family, and look upon our own, Lord, desires, and Lord, you know our prayers, and we just pray, Lord, that you'll meet us at the point of our need, and Lord, we don't want our wants, Lord, met by thee, just those things that are necessary, those things that are needful, and you know what's best, Lord, you're in control, you're able to understand the best thing for us. And you're able to answer prayer, Lord, in the way, uh, Lord, it would please thee. So, Lord, be with us tonight. And, and Lord, encourage our hearts. Remember, especially, O oh God, those who have gathered in the house. Remember, too, the internet listeners. We pray for them. And we ask that you'll encourage their hearts wherever they are as they're bowed in prayer with us as they're seeking thy face together with us we pray you'll richly bless us all and do us all good tonight lord and in thy house may the word of god be precious to us may it be valuable lord may it be something lord as, as priceless as the rarest jewel we could ever be given. And Lord, if we were to give him some jewel that's so rare that there's only one of its kind on earth and it's priceless, Lord, how we would cherish it and how we would hold on to it. It would never lose sight of it, Lord. And here we are, Lord, with thy word before us. And what a blessing, Lord. It's priceless. It's invaluable. We couldn't even, Lord, put any estimation upon its worth to our soul and to our lives. And without it, we're nothing. But we thank thee for the revelation of Holy Scripture, the scriptures of truth, the oracles of God. We thank thee for this infallible, inerrant, and inspired record. We thank 
thank thee for the word of God in our mother tongue. And we rejoice in our authorized translation on the English Bible. And we thank thee for the word of God to us. And we pray, oh, prepare our hearts to receive it. May we receive it, O oh God, as honeycomb sweet to the taste. May we receive it as water to a thirsty soul. May we receive it as bread and meat, Lord, and milk to a babe and to a hungry soul. May we receive it, O oh God, as light in our darkness. May we receive it, O oh God, as life in our deadness. May we know what it is to receive the engrafted word that is able not only to save the soul, but build up us in our holy faith. And we pray, O oh God, we will never substitute it, that we will hold it dear. We will, Lord, listen to the preaching of it. We will take it on board. We will receive it. And like James says, we'll not be forgetful hearers of it, but doers of the word. And loving Father, bless that word to our hearts. Create an highway now for the preaching of the word of God and prepare each heart, we pray. We were thinking on Sunday nights of the different grounds upon which the seed is sown. And we don't even want as believers to have an experience where we have a wayside heart or we have a stony heart or a heart that's Lord covered over with thorns and thistles and weeds and would choke the seed and would bring no real fruit in our lives. We cry, O God, you will prepare our hearts that we might be good ground hearers, Lord, that we might be, uh, Lord, soil that has been prepared and the seed will germinate and the seed will bring forth fruit. And Lord, it'll impact our lives. It will influence us. Write it indelibly upon our hearts. Let us not only be, Lord, those with a head knowledge, but with a a hard experience and understand the word of God. We think of how uh, Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch, understandest what thou readest. And we cry, O oh God, that we will understand tonight. Lord, we pray you'll give it to us, just as you said, Lord Jesus, uh, to uh, Peter that day. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hath not revealed these things unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And Lord, as one of old said, who teacheth like unto him. Lord, be our counsellor tonight. Instruct us in the things of God. And grant, Lord, it'll not be lost upon us. It'll not be over our heads, Lord. It'll not, O oh God, be beyond our understanding, but make it clear and simple and plain. And grant, O oh God, that the wayfaring man, though a fool, may not err therein. Create that highway, Lord, for the preaching of the word and let it run to our hearts and be glorified in our lives. And remember all who gather across the province for, Lord, a Bible study and a prayer time. Remember especially, O oh God, the, the work that has already gone into eternity last night and tonight. Remember the Lord Bible Club. We thank thee for those who have gathered, for the goodly number of boys and girls that have been brought in. Lord, this is thy doing. We think of a day when Lord, there's legislation abroad and a high court judge, Lord, legislates against Christianity being taught in the school. And yet, Lord, you are in control. Lord, if we can't get, Lord, the teachings of the Christian faith in the school, then you have it here in the church and you'll bring the young ones and the children and the boys and girls in. And you've done that. And Lord, we thank thee that you've honored thy servants who have done the outreach. You've honored them as they prepared. And we praise thee, Lord, and bless thee for those little ones who have come in under the sound of the word of God. And we praise thee for new children in. And we pray, Lord, as we touch the child, we may touch the home, and the Lord will touch the heart. And we pray you'll save these little ones. We pray for each one that every single child and young person would be brought to know Christ as their own and personal saviour. And then too, Lord, for the safe arrival of the team from um, Romania. We thank thee, Lord, for uh, thy good hand upon them. And we thank thee, Lord, for Deborah and Rachel and Luke and for a safe journey home. And as they would travel up here uh, to the province, Lord, from Dublin, we pray, Lord, you'll uh, go with them. And Lord, we thank thee for their labor of love in thy name. And we ask that you'll continue to bless. And we're not unmindful, Lord, of the need we have in our open airs when there's opposition and persecution. And there are those who don't want the gospel preached, Lord, and it's evident uh, most Sunday afternoons, Lord, with some opposition. And Lord, we're not deterred in any way, shape, or form. We're not put off. We realize, Lord, we need to press the battle to the gate. We're on the, the devil's territory. We realize we're taking ground. And some of the strongholds of 
of Satan, Lord, stand strong. Some of them, Lord, haven't been brought down. Lord, we pray, Lord, we will, by the gospel, cast down imaginations and the strongholds of the evil one. And we'll see, Lord, precious souls won for Christ, Lord, and thy name honoured and glorified. And we we'll remember, too, Lord, the special services throughout, Lord, even uh, these next few months. We pray especially, Lord, for the weddings that we have to attend to. We thank, Lord, of the apprentice boy service at the end of the month. We cry to thee, Lord, for the bringing in of the unsaved and for the blessing of God upon thy work in these days. And then too, Lord, during the holiday season, watch over our families, our church family, in the absence of our friends and others on holiday. Keep them safe and preserve and protect them and undertake for them. And as the work is rested for a little season, refresh the workers, we pray, and pour out graciously thy spirit. And then too, Lord, we think of the sick and sorrowing, the ongoing need. Pray especially, Lord, for this week for Hard and for Heather and for David and Faith and the children. We commend them lovingly to thee and their daughter too. We just leave them with the Lord and pray, Lord, you'll hear prayer for them and many others. So we commend, Lord, the Kennedy family and the Crawford family to thee. Lord, you know the need and we just commit all these matters to the Lord. Remember uh, Lord Davy Williamson and the funeral service tomorrow in the divine will. Lord, remember that family need and just commend them to God. So, Lord, be with us now and bless our hearts and the word to it. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, please. 1 John and the chapter 5. Just want to read a couple of verses to you. 1 John chapter 5 and verses 14 and 15. Just two verses. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And there we read in the word of God, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. This is the confidence that we have in Christ, that if we ask anything, According to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If you get nothing else from the Bible study and the prayer meeting tonight, we'll take the text home with you. And you pray over it, and you study it, you meditate upon it, and you bring it to the Lord. And I'm sure you will receive a blessing from these two verses. Father, grant to me the infilling of thy spirit now for the ministry and preaching forth of the word of life. Glorify thy Son in the blessing of thy word in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. You know, as we come to the Lord in prayer this evening, there are three things that we should keep in mind. The first thing is this, that God delights to answer prayer. Now, I don't have to remind you of that because you know that. Peter says you're a good minister of Christ if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Even though they know them, lest we forget, lest they slip our mind, they can come back to us with refreshment. But I say to you, there are three things we must keep in mind in this prayer meeting and in connection with this text of Scripture. And the first is this, God delights to answer prayer. And we think of the many commands and the promises that God has given in connection with prayer and Holy Scripture, then it's certainly true that God delights to answer prayer. In Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 we read, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God delights to answer prayer. Call unto me. He commands it. I will answer thee. So he delights to do that. And furthermore, we read in Luke's gospel the words of Christ when he said, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened unto him. God delights to answer prayer. But can I say secondly, keep this in mind as we come to the text. God delays to answer prayer. Daniel 10 shows us that Daniel waited for three whole weeks, 21 full days, fasting, mourning, seeking after God. Even though the answer 
was on its way the first day he prayed. God caused a delay in the answer to the prayers of Daniel. And the Bible says that he waited 21 full days before he actually got an answer from God. And you remember Luke chapter 8, in the case of Jairus' daughter, whenever he had requested from the master that he would come and lay his hand upon his daughter, for she was literally nigh unto death. You remember that that request was at first granted, but then there was a delay because there was a woman with an issue of blood. The crowd thronged the Lord. Someone touched the garment of Christ in a touch of faith, and the Lord then was delayed. And in the healing of that woman, Jairus, no doubt, was anxious to have the Lord present, thinking he must be there or before she could be healed forgetting that he could just speak the word and she would be healed. And you remember that what happened whenever he healed the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says the servants came and they said to, the, to Jairus, forget about it, your daughter has died. And of course the delay was for the honor and for the glory of God because if Christ had gotten there and she was still alive, there's no doubt he would have gotten glory. But the fact that she had physically died he received the greater glory. The same was the case. Whenever a request was sent from the house in Bethany, whenever Mary and Martha sent concerning Lazarus, he whom thou lovest is sick. He hadn't died. And when the Lord heard that, the Bible says that he delayed a further two days. And then he told the disciples that Lazarus had died. And when he arrived at Bethany, the Bible tells us that both Mary and Martha said the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not have died. And the Lord said that this delay was for the glory of God. And whenever he called for the stone to be rolled away, they said, Behold, he stinketh, for he hath now been dead four days. And the Lord delayed it for a simple reason, that when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, and he raised Lazarus from the dead, the delay was for his glory and he received the greater glory and I say to you that it's best to leave the answer with the Lord even though we want the answer to be such and such or we desire it and we cry and plead for it sometimes there's a delay and we've got to remember that God delights to answer prayer don't forget that when we come to interpret this text God delays to answer our prayers don't forget that but can I say something else thirdly? God determines the answer to our prayers. And he tells us that in the book of Isaiah. Whenever he says, for my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. My, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. It's hard to take that. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Neither are your ways of doing things my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and you can understand that, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's better to leave the answer with God. Whether he delights to answer your prayer right away, whether he delays that answer, or whether he determines a different answer, either way it's best to leave our prayers with God and accept what he does. So as we come to look at the text before us this evening, we should keep those three things in mind. And we will not make the mistake that many are making today, that when their prayers are offered and their prayers are not answered, or their prayers are answered in a different way, then they will not, well, sadly, they do blame God for a failure to keep his word and for not answering their prayers. So from the text, keeping those three things in mind, I want you to notice, first of all, the confidence that we should exhibit in prayer. The confidence that we should exhibit in prayer. Notice what it says in verse 14 there. And this is the confidence that we have in Christ. This is the confidence that we have in coming to the Lord. You know, the poor benighted Roman Catholic does not have this confidence. They don't have this assurance. They are not allowed. They are forbidden to go directly to God in prayer. They must pray through Mary. They must pray to 
saints, hoping they will carry their petitions to the Lord. They go through Mary. They go through the saints. They go through different channels in order for their prayers to be heard. And John tells us this is the confidence that we have. It's different from other religions and false religions. This is the confidence we have in Christ. In Christ. Now the word for confidence has a variety of meanings. I can do what is known as an Englishman search on a little Bible program that I have. And it will bring me up this word in the Greek and it will show me every reference to it in our New Testament. It will tell me how it's used. It will give me the context. It's a tremendous little tool. It's called an English man's search. Now, I don't know why they call it that, because the program, as far as I'm aware, is uh, based from America, but it's called an English man's search. And so looking at the meaning of this word, I, I looked it up, and it has a variety of meanings. And it simply means that this is the, sh the assurance we have. This is the freedom that we can experience coming to God unhindered in Christ. This is the openness. That's what the word means. This is the openness that we show coming to God. This is the boldness that we demonstrate coming into the presence of the Lord. This is the sureness or the confidence. And our translators have taken the word confidence on this occasion, meaning assurance that we exhibit as we come to God in prayer. I know as we come to the Lord tonight, we are assured that we are accepted with him. We're not coming thinking. We're not coming hoping. We're not coming saying, well, he might hear. We might get an answer. But we'll go anyway and see how it goes. No, this is the confidence we have. Remember the first thought? God delights to answer prayer. And this is the confidence we have. He delights to hear your prayers tonight. And he delights to answer those prayers tonight. Now, we'll get the fuller picture in a moment or two. Our confidence stems from our relationship to Christ. Notice what it says there, and this is the confidence that we have in him. It doesn't say this is the confidence that we have. We don't have any confidence coming to God. We're unworthy. This is the confidence we have in Christ, in him. And so our confidence coming to the Father, to the throne of grace, is because of Christ and because of our relationship with him, we are righteous through the righteousness of Christ imputed unto us. Our sins are all forgiven. We're clean through the word he has spoken. We are complete in him. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. This is your standing before almighty God. And you are righteous in Christ. You're accepted in the well-beloved. The blood has cleansed your sin. And you can stand before the throne in Christ, in union with him. And this is the confidence that in Christ we'll never be turned away. In Christ, God will delight to hear his children call upon him, bring their need to him, and pray over the work of God before him. And you know, we have the right to enter into God's presence. We don't have to go through a priest or a pope. We don't have to go through a saint or a Mary or a mediatrix or a mediator, but through Christ. This is the confidence we have tonight. We can gather on a Tuesday night and we're not beating the air and we're not wasting our time. And the world may laugh at us and mock at us and say, what are those people doing? They're, they're gathering for prayer. Sure, God, they'll never hear those people. Who do they think they are? Well, I'll tell you, we will be heard tonight. God will delight to answer our prayers because we have confidence in Christ. It stems not only this confidence from our relationship with Christ, but could I suggest to you it stems also from our redemption in Christ. Isn't that what Paul says writing to believers at Rome? Whenever he said, He that spurred not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now what an incentive to come to prayer. What motivation, encouragement for you to come to God tonight and to bring matters before him. This is the confidence that you should express and you should exhibit publicly a boldness, an assurance, an openness, a freedom, unhindered, without fear, without hindrance. This is the confidence. And if God has given Christ to the sorrows and sufferings of the cross for our sins, 
then he will not withhold anything necessary to help us live a godly and a Christ-honoring life. Our confidence also stems not only from our relationship with Christ and our redemption in Christ, but can I suggest as well our confidence coming to God in prayer stems from living right before Christ. And that what John said, and you could even turn over to chapter 3 of First John if you have your Bible with you, and look with me there at verses 21 and 2. Look what he says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence, assurance toward God, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Do you see that? If our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God in prayer. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You remember, if you're doing McShane's readings, I think it's Joshua chapter 7 today. And that's the chapter of Achan and the accursed thing and sin in the camp. 36 men lost their lives and meditated on it today at Ai. And it was there that they were defeated. It was there that prayer wasn't answered. And whenever Joshua got on his face before God and he cried unto God, and even in prayer, those elders blamed God. If you look at it, it's clear. They blamed the Lord. Why hast thou brought us out of Egypt to put us to death before such weak individuals as the Amorites? Why did you do that? They blamed God. I want to tell you, God didn't answer their prayers. He even said, neither will I be with you until you take the accursed thing out of the camp. I want to say to you that our confidence stems from our relationship with Christ, our redemption in Christ, but right living before Christ. We get answers to prayer by obedience and right living. It's a must for answered or answered prayer. For it gives us confidence before God because our hearts condemn us not. Didn't the Lord say the same thing? That when you come to worship and pray and to ask, and if you have something against your brother, you're to leave your gift at the altar and you're to go and be reconciled to your brother. And so the Lord links these things to answers to prayer. And I say this to you, God delights to answer prayer, doesn't he? He delights because of our relationship with Christ, our redemption in Christ, and right living before Christ. So the confidence we should exhibit in prayer. Notice secondly from this text of Scripture, uh, the conformity we should express in prayer. The conformity we should express in prayer. Look what it says in verse 14. If we ask anything. Now quite often people stop there. And we know that some of our friends who, who tell us that we have nothing and we're spiritual paupers, uh, that you haven't got the faith of a Rolls Royce, you've only the faith of an old mini, and some of the minis are really nice, by the way, just as good as a Rolls Royce, the way they make them now. But that's what they used to tell us many, many years ago. Uh, we were accused, you've only got the faith of whatever car you're driving, and I drove a rust bucket. Uh, I want to tell you there was paint breaking through my rust, never mind rust through the paint. And uh, there was one time at a car, you could see the ground underneath. And if you lifted the carpet, there was the ground. And the water came up, the carpet was soaking, and the car windows were always steamed up, and the car was always fusty smell. And whenever you were going out in the rain, and whenever you were literally driving to some of those services, the water came up through the hole. And how often I got it welded, and the boy said to me, you know, there's nothing else to weld it to. <laughs> so I knew it was time to change the motor uh, but you would appreciate and you would understand. Uh, people used to mock us and say, well, where's your faith? Where's your, have you got the faith of a Rolls Royce or that old uh, rust bucket that you're driving? Uh, and they linked this word anything. God says it. There it is. First John 5, 14. I read it. If we ask anything, anything. But I want to tell you something. That's not true at all. Uh, there's a vital requirement here. There's a conformity that we should express when we're praying to God. And it's this, if we ask anything, and there's the key, according to his will, he heareth us. Now, they're beautiful words. I tell you, they struck a chord with me today. Those words, I can't get them out of my head. He heareth us. Now, if you had nothing else to come to God tonight with on prayer, there it is, stand on that. 
He heareth us. But here's the context. Here's the teaching. If we ask anything, yes, anything, name it, anything. But yet, there's a vital requirement here. And it's this. Anything according to his will. Now that's the key. That's where they make the mistake. Most people quote part of the text. If we ask anything, God says he'll hear us and we will have the petitions, verse 15, that we desired of him. And he will hear us and he will give us what we want. That's what they say. They proceed to ask for everything and everything they want. And when the answer doesn't come, and we have heard it, we have heard people say, God has broken his word. I've actually heard people say that. They've said it to me. God has not kept his word. And he told me this. And there it is. 1 John 5, 14. Anything. If I ask, he never give it to me. But it says he'll hear me. But you know, it's sad when they accuse the Lord of failure when their failure really is with us. For it's not according to his will. Let's read the verse very carefully. If we ask anything according to To his will. Anything that is according to the will of God, he hears us. And by the way, when it says in the Bible he hears us, we don't need to add the words and answers. We don't need to add that. That's superfluous. When we say of God he hears us, that means he hears and answers. That's what that literally means. It's just one phrase to say those two thoughts. He answers prayer. He hears prayer. It's the same thing. I want to tell you there's some people and they could take a text like this if we ask anything. I'll use an extreme illustration so I don't get at anybody or you think, well, I know somebody like that or you might say that was me one time. But you know, there was people who maybe say, well, Lord, you know I'm broke. You know, Lord, I've lost my job and I'd like to take a chance. Nobody will know it. I'd like to do the lottery. And I pray you'll guide me, Lord, as I tick the box or circle the number. I'm not sure how it's done now. I've never done it and I never will. But I want to say, if they prayed, Lord, just guide me. Just get me the first five numbers and then the extra number. Lord, you know what what the numbers are going to be. You know all things. And Lord, I'm going to ask you now, anything, your word says anything, Lord. And you hear us and you'll give us the petitions that we desire. Lord, help me to win the lottery. Sort my problems out, Lord. And I'll not tell too many people. And I'll ask for secrecy, Lord. Just guide me. Just get me the numbers. Now you know full well, and so do I, the Lord will never answer a prayer like that. That's not according to his will. Or even say, Lord, prosper me. Lord, give me good success in an immoral lifestyle. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. Oh, Lord, I'm saved. But make this unsaved girl love me. It's not going to happen. God's not going to answer those prayers. So the key to answered prayer is prayer in the will of God and prayer for the glory of God. It was Oswald Chambers who said, I quote, The whole essence, that is, the heart, the center, the kernel, the whole essence of prayer is finding the mind of Christ, knowing the will of God, unquote. And when we know God's will, then we can pray with confidence and with conformity. James tells us, Ye ask and ye receive not, because ye ask amiss. In other words, to consume it on our lusts. We ask selfishly, fleshly, wrongly. Ye ask, but ye ask amiss. It's not according to the will of God. So how important it is for us to know God's mind and will. And then when we know that mind and will, we can come before the Lord with confidence, knowing he hears us and we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now, I'm not here to tell you tonight what God's will is and what God's will isn't. But one thing I can say and just give you a summary of it. There are many things that we pray about and they're God's will. Therefore, he will hear us tonight and he will give us the petitions that we desire of him. It is his will to bless the preaching of the word of God and to bless the preaching of the gospel of his grace. And when we pray God would bless his word, And he'll bless the preaching of the gospel in the house and in the open air. When we pray that God will bless every ambassador and preacher of the gospel, then we know, we are sure, we are confident that we will have an answer to prayer. And he'll hear us. And he'll give us the petitions that we desired of him. It's his will to save the lost. 
where we pray for the unconverted, we're praying according to the will of God. He hears us and he'll give us the petitions that we desire of him. It is his will to restore the backslider. It is his will to revive his church and to bless his work. And we can pray about those things. It is his will that you and I live a holy life. This is the will of God for you, Paul said to the church at Thessalonica. Even your sanctification, it's God's will you overcome sin. You overcome the world, the devil. You live a clean and a pure and a holy life. And when you pray about that, be sure the Lord will hear. And you'll have the petition, the power to live the Christian life that you desired of him. It is his will to comfort the sick and the sorrowing. A bruised reed he'll not break, and a smoking flax he'll not quench. You keep that in mind when you deal with those who are down and discouraged, or even those who have fallen. The Lord said, a bruised reed he'll not break, a smoking flax he'll not quench. It's God's will we restore. It's God's will that we comfort that we help and pray for the sick and sorrowing. It's God's will to help the weak, those who struggle with sin, those who have besetting sins, rather than condemn or point the finger. It's God's will we help the weak. It's God's will that we encourage the fallen and we, we bless his people with prayer. It's his will. Now these and many, many more things you could add as well. We can bring to the Lord tonight. And we know for sure that he will hear us because it's according to the divine will. And what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry in connection with what I just said. Everything to God in prayer. The confidence that we should exhibit in prayer. The conformity that we should express in prayer. And then finally, thirdly, you have the comfort that we should enjoy in prayer. Notice what it says, he heareth us. And if we know, verse 15, if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. He heareth us. He hears us. Whatsoever we ask, we know. We have the petitions that we desired of him. What a comfort tonight we have. John is saying basically this. If we're living right before the Lord, as he said there in chapter 3, and we know the mind and will of God and the Spirit of God, as it says here in chapter 5, according to his will, then we can be confident and we can be comforted and we can come to God and we will have our prayers heard in heaven. So what an encouragement for you and I for prayer tonight. He heareth us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Whenever we finish now, Whenever we're bowed in prayer, just you take those three words to the Lord now. Just say, Lord, your word says, he heareth us. He heareth us. We often see and say, Hagar, thou God seest me. And that's true. But what about you, child of God? He heareth us. And here we are tonight. And we have come to this house. And maybe we hadn't even thought about it. The Lord has bowed down his ear. And he's literally cut the ear. Or like the dog does, it pricks the ear. It's heard the sound and can move the ear to where that sound is, can literally move its ears in a different way than we can. Some animals have the ears going right round to the back. It never misses a sound. You think of the Lord who created that ear. His ear will hear. It will hear the silent prayer. That prayer that no one else should hear. That prayer that's the burden of your heart tonight. He'll hear the silent prayer. I want to tell you he'll hear the sorrowful prayer of a broken heart, of a sad soul, of a burdened individual, someone who couldn't even pray out loud because emotionally they would break down and they know it. And he'll hear the stammering prayer. Those who feel, well, I can't pray. I don't know how to pray the way those other people do and they've got the gift of prayer and I haven't. And if I open my mouth, it'll only be words and I'll not even know what I'm saying. I want to tell you something. When you can't express yourself and you feel you can't, tell the Lord how you feel. Well, he'll hear the stammering prayer. And that's what he says. He heareth us. We have the petitions that we desired of him. We're coming to the Lord tonight. And the Lord is good and the Lord is great and he's merciful and gracious and he's well able to give you exactly what you need. It was said during the reign of Alexander the Great that on one occasion... 
he was asked by a worker in his court for some financial aid. The great leader told him to go to his, and see his treasurer and ask for whatever amount he wanted. A while later, the treasurer came and appeared before Alexander, and he says that the man had asked for an enormous amount of money and that he had hesitated to give him so much. Alexander the Great replied, I quote, Give him what he asked for. He has treated me as a king in his asking, and I shall treat him as a king in my giving. Unquote. You men and women, how grieved is Christ whenever our heavenly king is grieved at our unbelief and meager asking. He's the Lord of all glory. He's almighty God. He's well able to give you what you need. He has promised that in Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he's challenged us. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 32.27. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to seek. Don't be afraid to knock on heaven's door tonight and seek the Lord according to his will and say, Lord, you hear us and we have the petitions we desired of thee. The hymn writer puts it like this as I close. Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such. None can ever ask too much. Another hymn put it like this. Behold the throne of grace. The promise calls me near. There Christ shows a smiling face. And he waits to answer prayer. My soul ask what thou wilt. Thou canst not be too bold. Since Christ's blood for thee was shed. What else can he withhold? Let me finish by reading the text to you again. 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is what it says, and this is the confidence that we have in Christ, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We pray the Lord will bless his word to all of our hearts this evening. I'd like to thank our internet listeners for joining with us, and we know that very shortly we'll be uh, coming off air and getting down to our season of prayer. But thank you for joining with us, and we trust the Lord has blessed you through the preaching of the word. Thank you.